You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi ho, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield Monster. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> I am to number two, page four. Are you out of your mind, Big Anklevich? Why are you talking in such a strange way? Oh, I don't know. I was just once told I sound like a Muppet. Oh, Big Anklevich, you don't sound like a Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> Biggie, oh, oh goodness. Mum, 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 no, 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 make it stop, stop, stop. Uh, also with us today, R-O-8-O-T and... Announcer man. Announcer man. Welcome, everyone. You know, he doesn't sound like a Muppet. He looks like a Muppet, yeah, though. He does. Hey, remember those old guys that complained? <laughs> it's like a form of torture, That those guys. Yeah, that's almost exactly the look. You're mocking me, aren't you? It's no, hard, no. It's hard to believe that a person can actually look that much like a Muppet. Warning, today's episode contains the F word. Sorry about that announcement. You know we mean you no harm. Back on topic, guys. Uh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. We're back, right? Or are we still Muppets? No, we're done. Has doing the voices like this made the pain go away? Oh, or? there was no pain. It wasn't even the first time I was told that I sound like a Muppet, so... Forget it! I thought it was funny because the criticism was for him instead of me. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to. I guess I'm talking to announcer man. Hey, how you doing? Oh, this is much Howdy. better. Press the button. Having trouble with that lighter? Please. I don't smoke myself. You smoke? No. Never Sorry, have. Sorry, you're SOL, pal. Okay. So today's story is On the Origin of Sounds by Christopher Fisher. Christopher Fisher is an editor in the field of criminal justice publishing and is also the fiction editor of Relief, a Christian literary expression, which you can find at ReliefJournal.com. He also teaches freshman composition at Sam Houston State University. His work has appeared in the Sam Houston State Review, Relief Journal, The Wittenberg Door, the Thou Shalt Not Horror Anthology, and The Longwood Guide to Writing. His fiction has received honorable mentions in both the Pushcart Prize, Best of the Small Presses, 2009 edition, and The Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, 2007. Originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, he now lives in East Texas with his beautiful wife and four rowdy kids. On the Origin of Sounds by Christopher Fisher Dr. Janet Hale, Senior Resident, Laurel Mental Wellness Center Dr. Hale, I am submitting to you the case file of patient William Serrell. Patient exhibits numerous symptoms of delusional paranoia especially auditory hallucination, which is apparently aggravated by severe depression and centered on an irrational fear of dwarfs. This case is unusually problematic as the patient happens to be a former doctor of psychiatry and has fallen into a pattern of self-diagnosis that seems to be hindering his progress even more than the denial phase seen in typical patients. Short of sedation, all treatments have failed. Special attention should be paid to certain of the patient's diary entries, which I have enclosed. Your opinion on this matter is greatly appreciated. Sincerely, Dr. Sam Dayton. Excerpts from the patient's personal journal beginning in May of this year. March 30th, 318 p.m. The last time I stood in this house, I was only ten years old. God, what happened to the boy who played here thirty years ago? 
who dug battle trenches in the empty lot next door and jousted black knights with a cane pole and a bicycle? How did the Billy, who relished this Louisiana heat, grow into William, a cowardly old man who sweats at the thought of shaking hands with a stranger? Then, all I wanted was to be a fireman. And look at me now, a stuffed shirt psychiatrist on the verge of a nervous breakdown. It isn't easy to admit that I haven't been at all well. I'm coming up on 40 this July. Each morning brings the fear of dying alone, without a family. Each night I feel my chances slipping further away. I have never even come close to marriage, and I'm sure my colleagues consider me a social idiot. The only love I've known is my work, and she has betrayed me. Dr. Wells, my psychiatrist, yes, even shrinks have shrinks, calls me a workaholic. After I confessed, I spend some nights crying and pulling at my hair. He prescribed six weeks of vacation with absolutely no work. He also gave me protriptyline. I objected due to the unusual side effects, but he thinks starting at a low dosage should be safe. This journal is also part of Dr. Wells's prescription. He thought it would help me to self-diagnose my problems and find my own ways to deal with them. I'm not sure why I decided to spend my vacation here in Ringgold. I guess I just wanted to see if the house was still here. When I was ten, right after Dad and Davy died in the car accident, Mom and I moved away to Dallas, closer to her family. She never sold this house, though. It was personal to her, I know. She and Dad were one of those rare couples that genuinely loved each other, had a happy life together, cut short as it was. They bought this house when they were first married and spent thirteen years within its walls. She could never let it go, just like she never found the will to remarry. Mom always said she kept the house because the property was worth twice what any realtor was willing to list it for, but it certainly isn't worth much now. The Mercedes looks a little out of place, parked out front. It makes the place look like one of those drug dealer shacks. I hired a crew to come through and clean the place up, so it looks much better than it did just three days ago. I'm also expecting a delivery truck to arrive in a few hours, with the furniture and small refrigerator I bought for my short stay here. But the walls are still dingy and water-stained from the leaky roof, and the attic creaks almost constantly, as if the roof could cave in any day. To be honest, I'm not sure if it's safe to sleep here, but I guess I'll find out soon enough. March 31st, 8.17 a.m. Last night I heard the most peculiar noises coming from the attic. It seems I have mice. I'll pick up some traps today. The noises continued almost all night. I know it's childish, but as I lay in bed listening to the sounds, I felt that I was seven again, battling fears of unfamiliar bumps in the night. Things came back to me, fears from my childhood I had completely forgotten. My brother Davy had a puppet, a Mexican marionette in bandito attire. Spangled sombrero and spurs, six-shooter in hand, a wide wooden grin on its face. Gave me the creeps. Some nights I would hear a click-clack, click-clack sound from down the hall, and I just knew it was that miniature bandito clicking and clacking toward my bedroom door, its strings dragging on the floor behind. I would lay there terrified that it was coming to get me, or worse, just to wave at me, only to click-clack back to Davy's room. Of course, I was also as terrified of the closet monster as any other child, and I couldn't bear to dangle my feet over the bed for fear that some zombie hand would reach up and grab me. I also had an absurd fear of the laundry room across the hall. I had this recurring nightmare about some gargoyle mechanics who ran a tire shop in that room after everyone was asleep. Where does a seven-year-old get such ideas? I mean, it's really funny when I think about it. But though I can laugh now, I have to admit that last night, as all this was coming back to me, I was a bit frightened. Anyway, I'm thinking maybe I'll do a little painting around the house, just to give my hands something to do and let my mind rest. Besides, maybe a little color will cheer me up. 1.48 p.m. Went into town and picked up some mouse traps from Nelson's Hardware. Just now went up to the attic to put out the traps. It's the damnedest thing. There's all kinds of stuff up there. Furniture. Old boxes of clothes, stacks of rain-soaked newspapers. Mom never told me she'd left so much of our stuff here. 
I'd like to sort through it all, see if there's anything worth keeping. But most of it seems to have been ruined by the leaky roof and almost thirty years of neglect. Besides, the place kind of gives me the creeps. Every time I turned around, I thought I heard a mouse skitter across the floor behind me. And I got the feeling something was watching me. I don't guess I'll be spending much time up there anyway. While at Nelson's, I picked up some paint and other supplies. I just couldn't wait till tomorrow to start with the painting. I met a lady at the store who works behind the counter. She may not be attractive by most standards. She is comically tall and thin. But I found her quite lovely. She had the sweetest voice I've heard in years. I thought about asking her to dinner. But I couldn't get up the nerve. Perhaps after a few more visits. I did forget the paint thinner. Freud might have speculated on that little oversight. So maybe I'll see her tomorrow. April 3rd, 12.31 p.m. Been busy painting and cleaning the house over the last few days, which is why I haven't written in this journal. I'm sure Dr. Wells will understand if I miss a day or two. I have to say I feel better than I have in a long time. It helps having accomplished something. I I'm almost done with the painting. All that's left is the garage in the front room. The mice in the attic, however, are becoming more of a problem. They seem to have evolved into rats in the short time I've been here. The traps have had no effect. Worked up the courage to go up the stairs and check them, but I haven't caught a single mouse. But I know they're up there. I was awake most of the night, trying to shut out the noise as they gnawed at the rafters. A horrible sound, like a beef carcass being torn apart by starving coyotes. I'll drive to Nelson's today and get some poison. Oh, by the way, I've spoken to the lady at Nelson's several times over the past few days. Her name is Regina. She's more attractive than I first thought. And wonder of wonders, I think she may actually like me. I've resolved to ask her out by the end of this week. This morning, while painting in Davy's old room, I made an amusing discovery. In the closet, carved into one of the baseboards, were the words, Billy eats his boogers. He caught me once. I couldn't have been five, but he taunted me with that phrase until the, the day of the accident. He'd chant it over and over until I screamed at him to stop. He also enjoyed assaulting me with such big brother weaponry as the steamroller, the noogie, and his all-time favorite, the wedgie. But none of them irritated me more than the booger chant. I sat for a moment staring at the odd inscription, laughing. And then, I don't know why, but for almost half an hour, I cried. April 4th, 3.17 a.m. Enough. I'm never going to get to sleep with all this noise. There must be a thousand of the little suckers up there. It's like mouse Mardi Gras. I laid out two dozen packages of poison, but it hasn't helped. I'm calling an exterminator first thing in the morning. What am I saying? It is morning. 9.14 a.m. That moron had the nerve to say I don't have a pest problem. Where there's rats, there's droppings, and you ain't got none. I almost slapped that grin right off his face. I told him to pretend I did have rats and to take care of them just like he would real ones. It's your money, mister. He laid out some white powder, which he said was better than anything I could get at the hardware store. I have to calm down. Tomorrow is Saturday, the day I promised myself I'd ask Regina to dinner. Losing all this sleep hasn't done much for my confidence. I can't let her see me like this. I'm a wreck. April 5th, 9.15 a.m. Last night was heavenly. Not one sound from the attic. I actually slept. Maybe now I'll have the courage to pop the question. <laughs> Listen to me. It's just dinner, and I'm acting like it's a marriage proposal. I'm just going to go and get this over with. Eleven fifty eight AM. I can't believe it. She said yes. Dinner tonight. Yes, yes, yes. April sixth, ten fifty six AM. Last night was the longest, most humiliating night of my life. It started out perfect. I picked Regina up at her place and we drove into Shreveport for dinner at one of the most expensive restaurants in town. She was impressed by the Mercedes. I hadn't counted on that, but 
It's kind of nice. A guy like me needs every edge he can get. The conversation was great, and as we finished dessert, she suggested we go back to my house for a drink. I thought I had it made. But once we got inside and sat down on the sofa, I heard another noise from the attic. Not now, I prayed. Please. I turned my reddened face to Regina and shook my head. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about what? I was relieved she hadn't heard it. I started to answer, to change the subject, or find some way to get her out of the house before the noises started up again. But just as I started to speak, I heard a loud thud against one of the rafters. I jumped to my feet, staring at the ceiling. What? Regina asked. She stood and took my hand. What's wrong? Didn't you hear that? Hear what? Shh! There it was again. There's nothing, she answered. Nothing but crickets. You keep talking over it. Just be quiet and listen for a minute. I didn't mean to be rude. It was just so frustrating. Every time she spoke, there was another thump, and the fact that she couldn't hear it was as unsettling as the sound itself, which I was slowly beginning to recognize. It was the sound of an axe chopping wood. Maybe if you'll tell me what I'm listening for... Damn it, I shouted. There it was again, three times. Now you just shut up for a minute. I'm leaving. There, I said, grabbing her arm. You had to have heard that one. She tore loose and ran for the door. As soon as she was gone, the thumping fell into a steady, rhythmic chopping and was joined by the sound of a two-man saw. It sounded like a team of loggers hard at work. The pace quickened until there was a creaking, cracking of wood, followed by a tremendous crash. It's impossible, I know, but it sounded exactly like a tree had been cut down in my attic. I looked out the open door. Regina had stopped halfway down the driveway and turned around. She was staring at the roof with a puzzled look. I ran out on the porch. You heard that, didn't you? I screamed. See, I told you, you heard it. She ran down the street toward the corner gas station. I can only guess she called a friend or a cab and made it home safely, for I haven't heard from her since. And I pray I never do. Just about the time Regina disappeared into the darkness, a realization hit me like a kick in the chest. Someone was in my attic. Someone was in my attic with an axe. I ran to the phone and called the police. Then I grabbed an old broom handle and waited in the front room with my back to a corner. The officer searched the house and found nothing. In the attic, he couldn't even find a trace of sawdust. I assured him of what I had heard, and he asked the usual questions. Have you been drinking? Are you taking any medication? Unfortunately, I had to answer yes to both. But I quickly explained that I'd only had two drinks. Then he just had to ask what medication I was taking. Protriptyline, he repeated. What's that? It's an antidepressant, I admitted, avoiding his gaze. Hmm, he muttered with a roll of his eyes. Sir, do you need medical attention? I just stared hard at him until he went for the door. Just before shutting it behind him, he turned and winked at me. That lumberjack of yours comes back. Just give us a call. I could have killed. I thought about what he said, though, and I was careful not to enter a state of blind denial. He had good reason to think it was all in my head. But as a doctor, I've had some experience with hallucinations, visual and auditory. Hallucinations are never heard by more than one person at the same time. I am positive Regina heard that tree crash. After I had calmed down a bit, I turned off the lights and crawled into bed. The house seemed darker than usual. There was a disturbing silence. The kind of quiet that makes you think you can hear air molecules floating around your head. I lay there, eyes wide, for several minutes. In that moment, I would have welcomed the sound of rats chewing on the rafters. But there was nothing. Until a faint creaking of a nasty hinge became noticeable. Turning toward the sound, I saw the closet door swinging slowly open. It stopped, leaving a crack barely wide enough to poke a head through. My heart raced. Sweat rose on my forehead. My mouth went dry as paper. I prayed to God this really was a hallucination. Then, from somewhere in the blackness, behind the closet door, came a slow, Snake-like whisper. Billy. 
I sprang out of bed and ran into the living room where I grabbed the phone and called the police again. This time, they sent two officers. They searched the house and the attic, and, like before, found nothing. I'm lucky they didn't take me in. April 8th, 5.24 a.m. The past two nights were terrible. The noises have grown even more oppressive. I haven't slept a single hour. I keep hearing the puppet, that damn bandito puppet clicking and clacking its wooden feet up and down the hall. It seems clear that my reason is slipping, but my awareness of that possibility is evidence to the contrary. If I were insane, I would undoubtedly be in a state of denial, utterly convinced that I am of sound mind. The only other explanation is that I am not alone in this house, that the sounds are as real as the pen I write with. But I've searched every room, including the attic, at least a dozen times. Each time I come to the same conclusion as the officers. There is no one else in the house. I am alone. April 9th, 3.17 p.m. The events of last night have reduced me to a state of constant terror and panic. And the details of those events have me leaning toward the opinion that I am indeed insane. Sometime around ten, I turned in for bed. Just just as I found myself drifting off, I heard voices from down the hall. There were at least three of them, and they were whispering, counting together. One, One two, two, three. three. Suddenly, they shouted in unison. This is so crazy. They started shouting the booger chant. Billy eats his boogers. Billy eats his boogers. Billy eats his boogers. Billy eats his boogers. Billy over his boogers. and over for five minutes. Oh, and the voices. High pitched little boogers. midget voices. Billy Just like something from the merry old land of Oz. Three little munchkins. <laughs> the lollipop guild sings the hits, including your favorite and mine, the booger chant. <laughs> and the chanting finally stopped. The munchkins laughed ecstatically for a minute, then scurried off to somewhere else in the house. The silence was even worse than the chanting. I couldn't bear wondering what I might hear next. Though I heard no sound for the rest of the night, I lay awake until sunrise. My blanket pulled over my face like a child. April 10th, 6.13 a.m. That's it. I'm nuts. I must be. Last night, I had finally achieved a state of sleep when I sat upright to the sound of a marching band blaring out stars and stripes forever. The band played for an hour, the sound of crashing cymbals and blasting horns pouring through the ceiling over my bed. When I could stand it no longer, I got up and turned on the light. The music stopped. I stood still for a moment, hearing nothing but frogs, crickets, and an awful ringing in my ears. Then I turned off the light and climbed back into bed. No sooner had the mattress spring stopped creaking than the band started up again. It played on and on until I screamed and pulled at my hair. Tonight, tonight I'm going to take care of this the same way my father did when I was a boy. On the nights when I woke up crying about monsters, he would come in here and force me to face my fear. Where's the monster, he'd ask. In the closet, I'd answer, or, or under the bed, or, or wherever monsters happen to be on that night. Okay, Billy, you know the drill. Get up and open the door. But he's in there. Open it. I did. And as always, there was nothing but clothes and shoes. Fear knocked on the door, Billy, Dad would say in his most wise and condescending tone. Faith answered it, and there was no one there. Now go to bed. Tonight. April 11th, 1.37 p.m. I did it! Around midnight, I heard something in the laundry room. It was very soft at first, but grew louder until I recognized the unmistakable sounds of a car repair shop. I heard the floop, floop 
of an air wrench tightening lug nuts, I heard a low, gravelly gargoyle voice shout, Hey, Jim, throw me that five-eighths. Then I heard another voice speaking to a customer. Well, ma'am, seems you've got a problem with your cataclysmic converter. That's why it makes this noise here. An engine revved, and the customer said, Oh, dear. You've also got a bad transition. That's why you're having so much trouble making it over hills. Oh, my. I slowly got out of bed, walked to the bedroom door, and stood there for a moment, terrified. Fear knocked on the door, I said to myself. Faith answered. I gained some strength from saying it, so I repeated the phrase again and again. I crossed the hall toward the laundry room. From inside, I could still hear the mechanic and the customer. So it looks like this car is completely shot, ma'am. Oh, dear me, whatever will I do? Well, I know where you can get a Mercedes for free. (laughs) There's this crazy psychiatrist who never uses his anymore. He just stays inside all day and pretends he's hearing things. (laughs) They both laughed. I took another step. For free? Asked the customer. What's the catch? Oh, well, you have to kill him, of course. Oh, I wouldn't know the first thing about killing someone. Well, nothing to it. It's easy to kill humans, especially bad little boys like this one. Fear knocked, I panted. Faith answered. But with this one, I think you'll have to bite off his toes and fingers one by one. And then you should peel off his skin while he's still alive. But slowly, so he doesn't just faint dead away. You can even borrow my tools if you want. Fear knocked. Faith answered, I chanted, placing a sweaty hand on the doorknob. Oh, I just couldn't, said the customer. Well, Well, ma'am, for you, you, I'll I'll take take care care of it myself. Jim, Joe, come help me for a minute. It's time to kill that crazy doctor. Yes, sir, said an effete British accent. And And might might I say say it's it's about about time. time. Lunch time already? Asked the other. I heard them coming. Six heavy gargoyle feet pounding in rhythm on the floor, coming closer, just on the other side of the door. Faith answered. Faith answered. I pushed the door open, and there was no one there. I went back to bed and slept. Oh, how I slept. I awoke this afternoon, feeling stronger than I have in years. I've done it. It's over. April 12th. Question mark. Oh, God. Please help me. Help me. Maybe I am crazy. I can't tell anymore. Writing in a hotel room off I-20. I had to get away from that house. I didn't take a thing. Just my wallet. The clothes I'm wearing. This journal. When I left, I was certain there was more going on than hallucinations. Not sure now. But yes. Yes. Yes, yes. The the sounds I've been hearing might have been my imagination. But this time I saw it. I felt it. I even have bruises and they are no hallucination. I went to bed last night believing I would never hear the noises or voices again. I had faced my fear and destroyed it. But late in the night, I woke to the most horrible shrieks and howls accompanied by crashing and creaking. I had the impression of a dozen chimpanzees up in the attic, dumping over boxes and swinging from the rafters. This time, I stood slowly to my feet. My mind was strangely calm. For too long, I had entertained the notion that I was losing my mind. It was clear at the time, beyond any doubt, that someone was in the house with me. The noises were all part of a sick, twisted joke meant to torment me. It enraged me. For the first time, I felt no fear. I crept to the living room and found the old broom handle. Then I went to the kitchen and grabbed the flashlight. But I didn't turn it on. Not yet. Quietly, I crept to the attic door and opened it ever so slowly. The sounds continued. 
Whatever was up there thought I was still in my bed, hiding under the covers. Just then, I heard a munchkin voice whisper, Do a lion! There were hushed little snickers, followed by the unmistakable roar of a lion. Then more snickering. That was a good one. I started up the stairs with the flashlight in one hand, still turned off, and the broom handle in the other. I took my time, making sure the stairs did not creak. The noises grew louder with each step I climbed. At the top... I could feel movement all around me and could barely see a figure swinging back and forth from a rafter just ten feet in front of me. Gripping the broom handle, I lifted the flashlight and clicked it on. A sudden silence exploded in my ears as the beam cut through the darkness. There in front of me, still swinging slightly by his arms, was a short man in blue overalls. There was a horrified, shameful look on his face, the expression of a boy who just got caught looking at dirty magazines. I waved the flashlight beam around me to see seven, perhaps eight more little men, all staring back at me with the same expression. I couldn't speak. I I mean, what do you say to a bunch of munchkins who've been living in your attic, terrorizing you with every noise imaginable? But I never got a chance to say a word. Their shock at being caught quickly wore off, and one of them jumped from a rafter onto my head. He pulled my hair and clawed at my eyes. I screamed and tried to throw him off. One of the other munchkins shouted, Let's get him, guys! Then they all piled on top of me. I kicked and punched, trying to tear them off. But two of them came up behind me and... I can still barely believe this myself. They gave me a wedgie. I lost my balance and fell backward. The munchkins jumped off of me, one of them kicking me viciously in the shin as I toppled down the stairs. I tumbled down, head over feet, and crashed into the door at the bottom. Then I ran. I just ran to the car. Even as I drove away, I could hear them inside shouting, Billy eats his boogers. Billy eats his boogers. Over and over. I drove straight to the interstate, and I didn't stop until I got to this hotel. Looking over all that has happened, all that I've written in this journal, I know how it sounds. I know what Dr. Wells will think. And I will have to agree with him that some details seem to be the result of repressed grief from my childhood, or possibly side effects from the medication. And though I do have the bruises, they will prove nothing to him. Only that I fell down the stairs after a disturbing hallucination. I must decide now whether or not to show this journal to the doctor. The munchkins in the attic were real. (laughs) Listen to how that sounds. He'll never believe me. He'll have me locked up is what he'll do. Put me in a room with a nice view of a padded wall. But if I am crazy... Maybe that's what I need. I'm so confused. I don't even know what's real anymore. June 1st, 10.30 a.m. After long and thoughtful debate, I've agreed with Dr. Wells to spend six months in the Laurel Mental Wellness Center. It's a private institution and is quite comfortable It took me a while to finally decide to go to Dr. Wells again. I tried denial, weighed every possibility, not wanting to surrender to the notion that I am insane. But the idea of dwarfs living in my attic, though witnessed by my own eyes, is simply not plausible. So the only option left is that I am crazy. I still find it strange that I am aware of my insanity. Dr. Dayton, my attending physician, has made a more thorough examination and concluded that what Dr. Wells thought was mild depression was actually the early stages of schizophrenia, the accompanying paranoia, with some help from the protriptyline, caused the hallucinations. Though I trust his diagnosis, I still cannot explain why Regina turned suddenly as the tree fell or how I acquired the bruises, but I especially have trouble with what I noticed the morning I woke in the hotel that a large patch of hair had been ripped out of my scalp. No, I didn't do it myself. Yes, I am quite sure. The staff here has allowed me to continue my journal. Dr. Dayton thought it would be excellent therapy. However, I am allowed 
to only have loose paper and a crayon, as I am still on suicide watch. But otherwise, there is not much to complain about. Well, there is one thing. There is a man who works in the kitchen here, a short little munchkin of a man. He has never been unkind or even paid me the slightest bit of attention. Nevertheless, I am terrified of him. And though my writing this may add a month to my stay here, I must confess that last night I heard the most peculiar noises. Author's Note Yeah, this story started like a lot of Ray Bradbury's stories start from just a title, which really wasn't even mine. I got the title from my best friend back in Oklahoma, Jason Ross. We'd done a lot of collaborative work, uh, mostly with songwriting and recording, but a little fiction here and there as well. He called me up once while I was in college here in Texas, and I was telling him about some of the fiction I was working on. And he said, oh, hey, I got an idea the other day for a story. I asked him what it was about, and he was like, oh, I don't really know. I just had this image of a grown man lying in bed with the covers pulled up to his eyes you know, scared like a child, and he's hearing all these sounds all over the house trying to figure out where they're coming from. So I asked him if he had a title, and he said, yeah, on the origin of sounds. I just thought, wow, I mean, it's a great title, and I can say that without bragging since it was Jason's and not mine. And I said right then, I think I can write this story if you want to let me take a shot at it. He said, sure, I'd love to see it. Well, I finished the first draft and sent him a copy. Uh, I guess that was about 12 years ago. It's been through the revision ringer probably 30 times since then and submitted all over. But I think I finally found the perfect venue with Dune Steve since it's really a story that's better heard than read. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. I know I did. How do you like that? I think it's time to retire that phrase. We retired it a long time ago. I'm unretiring it now. Like George Foreman. Right. Coming back for my fourth title of the world. That's the only area of sports in which I can hold my own is boxing. Yeah? It's the only area of sports that doesn't you make want, me cringe. You want to box right now? <laughs> If it can be the old-timey 20s boxing. Where you just stand toe-to-toe and then punch each other in the chin until somebody finally dies. I would watch that. (laughs) They have that again. It's called Ultimate Fighting. Yeah, my uncle watches that. Yeah. It's vile. It is. But it always. Yeah, the worst thing is these days, because sometimes when I throw on, like, the radio, you know, look on the sports stations, and they actually have, like, people on there just talking all about Ultimate Fighting Challenge. Yeah, championship. Pisses me off. So, uh, yeah, what did you think of the show, Rish? I'll, I'll tell you, like I said, I really enjoyed it. Now, hey, hey, if you ever didn't enjoy a story, what would you say? I don't know. I, maybe I'd have a oh, wait, OT do it. Oh, wait, I actually did that with somebody's story. Maybe I better not say that. Maybe I'd have announcer man say that. Or, oh, wait, I did that too. I think Big is right. Um, okay, well, I, I don't know that this is the best time to talk about this. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth in a future episode about how our stories are selected and the winnowing process. But have we ever had a story that you didn't like on the air? I don't think we've had one that I didn't like. We've had some that were favorites, there were some, some that weren't favorites. Yeah, some that were favorites. Some that I'm pretty sure were more your favorites than mine. But, you know, we're a team. So I take one for the team sometimes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't always have to be the one in charge and stuff. Well, see, that's funny because I do. I have to be the guy who's calling the shots. <laughs> I've noticed that, actually. I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. Okay, so this is one of the stories that went through the regular winnowing process, right? Well, I, I think I actually jumped ahead on this one. I think I read it before any of our readers did, Oh, if I remember right. And why? Just I was reading stories. I don't know. Maybe we'd gotten behind. I can't can't say exactly why it was that I did. But I remember reading the story and the the funny thing about it was I I had printed it out and I was reading it as I was heading to bed. I think my wife was already asleep next to me. So I'm laying and it's getting pretty late. It may have been like one o'clock in the morning when I was reading this story. It was on this night where out of the blue, the wind had just seriously picked up. 
it was hot, so we had all the windows open in the house. And so I'm sitting here reading this story, and it's talking about scary sounds. And I'm hearing like our wind chimes outside banging around, and there's all these bumps and strange noises going on as I'm reading this. And for some reason, the combination of these two is freaking me out. I actually had to get up and like I went outside and took the wind chime off of its hook and set it on the ground because. So I was getting freaked out by it because the wind was really blowing and it was banging, making a lot of weird noises. It was just funny because I'm not the kind of a person that just reading a story is going to freak them out. That I can work myself up into a frenzy or into fear just by reading something. And so this story really struck a chord with me, I guess. So yeah, as soon as I was done with that one, I sent it off to you and I said, that you know, I think we need to take this one. Because it actually made me scared. That's cool. I have just this vivid, overactive, monstrously cruel imagination uh-huh. where my mind likes to play tricks on me. And I'm, I'm an adult. Sort of. <laughs> and I still wake up in the night and I think I've heard someone in the room or... <laughs> Oh, okay. The, the other night, I decided to watch a whole bunch of horror movies. And I just went to On Demand and see, oh, what horror is on there? And so I stayed up until like five in the morning watching wow. horror. Uh, I, oh, and I, I was completely alone in the house. No way. And when it was all done and I was turning off all the lights and stuff, I just kept hearing all these sounds. And you know what? Maybe the sounds are always with us of a house settling, of the wind blowing, of... <laughs> All the sounds that happen in a normal house, but you don't notice them until you've got the adrenaline flowing or you're listening specifically for the sound of somebody's fingernails on the glass of your window. (laughs) Just a branch. I got to admit, I left the light on and just went to bed with the light on, (laughs) mostly because I've learned from experience that I'm going to imagine stuff in the room. I really am. It sucks. You know, I'm like, I'm eternally six years old. But if I don't have the light on, I'm just going to imagine somebody standing there at the doorway or watching me or something like that if I don't have a light on to show that it's not there. But anyhow, the next day I went down in the basement. And I think I was going to do laundry. And the bathroom window was open and the screen had been taken off. I know it was my uncle working on the sprinklers because that's the only explanation. But I am so grateful that I didn't discover that the night before when I was all freaked out. And so because down there in the basement, I, I, I couldn't have handled that. I can't remember the last time something like that has happened to me where I've gotten myself worked up and scared. Probably not since I lived in the house that I used to call the haunted house. Just something very freaky about that house. And I think we've mentioned it on the show before. That I was inspired to write several horror stories while I was there because it made me think of the apartment that the kid lived in in The Sixth Sense. And I spooked myself out all the time in that place. But since then, pretty much nothing until I read this story. Eight well, years, scare-free. That sounds like <laughs> a high compliment to you, Christopher. Consider it a job well done. Yeah. And uh, as far as the editing <laughs> of this one goes, it's a kind of a funny st- – well, it's not a funny story. It's, well, it's actually a long story that we should cut out. But before we do, I'm going to tell the story. You were gone. You, you had gone to Canada. Uh-huh. And I had this story. I read through it and it, it was so obvious to me that this is something I could do on my own. We didn't even need to get together. I could just record into my microphone the whole damn story because it's all – Except for that very, very beginning part, one person telling something that happened to him. We didn't even need a woman to be the potential girlfriend. And so I just recorded the whole darn thing on my microphone, my new one. And uh, before I sent it to you, I started to edit it and discovered that the sound was all messed up. So I recorded it all again (laughs) and edited it all myself. Then we got you to do the psychiatrist at the beginning. Anyway, it, was, it gave me a glimpse into how difficult your job is with the uh, the editing day-to-day of, of the show, especially since it was just me and I, I didn't have to juggle 50 sound effects and four other voice actors with varying degrees of static and, and echo on their readings. And So this was basically just something that we were able to do really quick. By the time you got back from Canada, it was all done. And mm-hmm. I don't know if that irritated you because you didn't really get a, a say in it. But if so, you haven't said so. so I needed that. to stamp my feet and throw a little hissy fit like you when you don't get a part in one. Hey, I need a part in all our stories. <laughs> all right. It's funny because some of the stuff that we talk about a lot 
is that bit that I say at the start when I'm the psychiatrist that we say that this guy has an irrational fear of dwarves. You know, the story leaves it up in the air. Is it irrational or is it not? Who knows? Is this guy really crazy or are dwarves torturing him with sound effects? But yeah, you were asking me to think about the irrational fears that I have. Well, see, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity for another one of our lists, which uh -huh. are my favorite episodes where right. you and I share lists. Because, yeah, you know me. I've got a lot of things that I am afraid of <laughs> that other people aren't. Now, dwarves aren't one of them. But my buddy Jeff is just terrified. Like little girl freaked out by <laughs> moths. Really? And, yeah, just today coming over to your house, there was a moth that came into your house. And I have no problem catching it and letting it go. And I'm sure you have no problem killing them or, or whatever you do with moths. Uh -huh. But he I is like, ah, 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 take it away, take it away kind of thing. It's like fire with the scarecrow or water with the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> Granted, his mom and dad were killed by moths when he was three years old. <laughs> but still. It it's funny. Everybody has their own uh, little irrational fears. And you wanted me to make a list up. And I think I've pretty much failed, unfortunately. So you have none. You have no irrational <laughs> fears. Now, when we did Woman Called Witch, which was an episode we did in the first year, I talked a little bit about a couple of the things that I'm afraid of. Uh, so I'll reiterate some of that. But maybe I'll just read mine and, and we can talk about each one of them. You can tell me whether you're afraid of genital deformations. or, or I am afraid of that, well, especially if it's my own. Um, I try to think of irrational fears, but most of the stuff that I'm most afraid of I don't feel is irrational. I think it's not necessarily likely, but... It is up to you what is irrational and what isn't. But yeah, something that's understandable like snakes or scorpions or Satanists or maggots or murderers or Michael Bay movies, those are all things that it's understandable if you're terrified of them. But what I wanted to talk about was just like odd, difficult to relate to fears, you know, like Muppets. You know, we started the Muppet thing. I, I, I don't know anybody that's afraid of Muppets, but I know people that are terrified of balloons. And maybe that comes from huh. when they were a kid, one popped and they just associate a balloon with a scary sound from when they were one or whatever the deal is. Or th There are lots of things that you could be afraid of, like, uh, like that old game Cootie or feminine hygiene products or people from the okay. South. Uh -huh. and, and so I made a list of five things. Okay. All right. So number five. And again, you know all of this, but maybe a new listener or maybe Christopher doesn't know this if he's still okay. listening. Yeah, he's okay, probably Okay, so number five off, but... is somehow, somehow malevolent, malevolent children. children. Uh-huh. I don't know. Just there's a way that kids are, whether it's playful or good-natured or active. And then to see a child that is completely silent and still and looking around with some kind of intelligence behind its eyes frightens me. Uh-huh. And... I think our buddy Ian shared my fear because he would always talk about, wouldn't it be creepy if somebody made a movie about feral children, and like <laughs> children that ran on all fours. They were more wolf or ape-like than regular children. And I was just like, yeah, I'd go see that in a second. Um, <laughs> I actually knew a child that did that and he would actually run around on all fours like Tarzan did in that movie and it was pretty freakish. Okay. Now, you've never been attacked by, like, an army of, of inbred South American children, right? No. Okay. See this scar? Oh. Four-year-old. Okay. So number four, unfounded fears for me, cockroaches. I, I, I like bugs. You've seen me pick up praying mantises uh -huh. and spiders, and I picked up the moth today. But cockroaches really, really freak me out. Cockroaches are gross. They're dirty, nasty things. Yeah, but what's the difference between a cricket, say, that's also a black six-legged insect that scurries under your door or you find in the house, and a cockroach? There's probably not that big of a difference except <laughs> but, for I like crickets. I think crickets are cool. Yeah. I would not stomp on a cricket, but a cockroach, I might call you to come over and stomp <laughs> it. Okay, My that's not true. But when I lived in L.A., invariably there would be a cockroach in my apartment, I don't know, twice a month. I remember I was late for work in the morning. It was time to go, and I was I was out the door because, you know, I had to be there at 8.30, and it was 8.32. Right. And there was a big brown cockroach on the living room floor, and uh, I grabbed – I think it was a shoe, uh -huh. like a dress shoe, and I just smashed it. And this black ichor <laughs> squirted out all over my white shirt and tie. 
Nice. And how a two-inch cockroach <laughs> could have that much liquid inside it, I don't know. But it was just like, ah, ah, well, you know, get it off, get it off. <laughs> I think my first inclination was to go shower. And, you know, it's just going to curl up in fetal position in the shower like Bond's girlfriend did in Casino Royale. I guess you could say that I have an irrational fear of cockroaches. I'm not like get up on a chair and scream like a little girl afraid of cockroaches. But if I see a cockroach in my house, I must kill it. I cannot go to bed until I have pulled out whatever dresser or cabinet or whatever thing it has gone to hide under and have squashed this cockroach. One of the movies that I saw probably when I was too young to be allowed to see scary movies. We all did. And I remember I, w I had a birthday party at a friend's house and it was a spend the night birthday party. We watched Creepshow. This movie freaked me out. There was a lot of scary stuff in that movie, especially for a poor little eight-year-old. And there was the uh, segment, because the, the movie was in various segments. It was basically like our show. It was short stories that they turned into a full-length feature. And yeah, they had one about a house that is basically, or I think it may have an apartment, but it was invaded by cockroaches. There's this guy in there, and these cockroaches are coming from everywhere. For anybody who wants to see Creepshow and hasn't seen it, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you the end of the cockroach part. At the end, they have a shot where this guy is laying on the ground, and you see something kind of writhing underneath his skin or something, but there's this weird movement going on in his stomach area. And then all of a sudden, the cockroaches start pouring out of his mouth. And, oh, still haunts me to this day. And that's like 25 years ago. Yeah. Wow. You've never seen it since. I haven't. No, I remember it that well just from that. I got George Romero to sign my creep show poster. Uh -huh. And I told him that, you know, I convinced my mom that it was, you know, comic booky, and so that it was totally okay <laughs> for her to rent. And he, I guess he hears that all the time of people that saw creep show way too young <laughs> <laughs> so what's uh, what's next on your list okay number three faces in windows <laughs> it's something that has always been part of my fear of my subconscious of the what if what, what wouldn't it be awful if kind of scenarios that go through my mind and just the idea of being alone somewhere believing that you're alone and then looking at a window and someone is looking in at you that can't be an irrational fear, can it? I guess it's not totally irrational because, I mean, if you're there by yourself and somebody's standing looking in the window at you, can they be a good reason? I guess it could be a friend that came by and knocked on the door and you didn't hear or I don't know what. But not likely that there's somebody just going to be staring in the window at you unless they're up to no good. It, it could just be a pervert. Yeah, I, I guess. Come on, don't <laughs> discount the harmlessness. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of... Uh, Fear reminds me of that movie, Three Men and a Baby. Terror classic, Three Men and a Baby. No, there's the, the, the whole bit. It's like an urban legend about this movie where there's a scene, and in the background, if you pay attention, it looks like there's a face of some little kid looking in the window, and the urban legend is built, built around it that, you know, this is some kid who died at this place and now his ghost is haunting the studio or whatever the heck that they shot this in the best part of that story was that it just plagued the editors that, that he kept turning up in scene after scene and they'd cut it out and then go to the next one and there he'd be again and ultimately you know he's still in that one shot I yeah know. it's i mean if you look at it it really looks real you're crazy dude it's a cardboard cutout of ted danson but yeah, it's, it was a fun urban legend. It really had a good story to it. And again, it freaks you out when you look at that and they're like, here's the scene. Here, watch, watch, look. There it is. That was good times. You say it's not irrational, and I guess not, but has it ever happened to you? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll let you tell that story. Well, Wes Craven said that he got the inspiration for Freddy Krueger from that when he was a little boy, like six or seven years old. I guess there was an old man that lived on the block or, or a maintenance man or something like that. Crazy old man. And w there was a crazy old man and, and he was getting up for like a drink of water or whatever. And this guy was looking in at him and it just freaked poor little <laughs> Wes Craven out. And the guy just stood there and smiled. <laughs> and he 
explained it away that, you know, it was just a malevolent bastard who liked to scare little kids. At least that's how he talks about it. <laughs> but that that stuck with him for a long, long time. And he imagined that Freddy Krueger, when he was alive, was somebody like that, who just liked to scare little kids. And, and now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a story nearly as good as Wes Craven's. Uh -huh. But when I was like 12 or 13, my cousin got together with some of his a-hole friends. And I guess in the middle of the night, they decided it would be fun to come and, and scare me. <laughs> so Which it wouldn't was, take much. No, it wouldn't. So I, I imagine it was 2 or 3 in the morning, maybe earlier. Who knows? When you're a kid, the middle of the night could be 11. But I, I, I wake up because I hear something. They came to the window, you know, in the darkness, and, and they were whispering my name. And I don't know how long they'd been doing it. Maybe they had just gotten there. And I made a noise. And I'm sure it caused them delight to hear me because I made a noise like, ah, like that. And then one of them banged on the window and they all went, ah, and then they ran away. And I knew who it was because I could recognize like my cousin's laughter. Mm -hmm. just, not a real good person he was. And, um, he's in hell now, actually. No, he soon will be, though. Good. And I couldn't go to sleep after that. Well, I thought, gosh, they're going to do it again because they got a laugh out of it. And what can I do? Because they're, they're not going to let me sleep. And, and the fear of them coming back and scaring me again and having something to laugh about really bothered me. So what I should have done was awakened my father and said that somebody's breaking into the house and have him kill them. But that didn't <laughs> occur to me until later. So what I did was I went down the hall and I got into the Halloween box and I got a mask, like a fright mask. And I just had it, put it on my bed. In the dark, I just waited. And I don't know how long passed, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, may only have been 10. But suddenly I could hear that, shh, okay, hey, I'll go back. All right, be quiet, be quiet, kind of thing. So I put the mask on and I got up <laughs> on my bed and I stood there and I waited. And as soon as I could hear them gathering around my window, ready to, you know, say my name or to bang, I jumped out and went, ah, with the mask. And they all screamed and scattered. They didn't come back that night. And I didn't get beat up the next day at school. So I guess they figured we were even. I gave as good as I got. Maybe they respect that. Maybe shitheads respect that sort of thing. <laughs> you, you tell me. I, I don't know. Well, I've been one of those for a long time. What's your next item on your list? Okay, number two, ghosts. <laughs> Need I say more? Ghosts. And we've talked about that on the air. We talked about my uncle having all sorts of experiences with ghosts. And he'll just mention it casually. He's like, Mom came and talked to me last night. And I'll be like, oh, you dead, Mom? And he's like, yeah. She asked about you. <laughs> and she said that the you know the troubles I was having they'll probably pass soon, but she was watching and I, he just tells these stories so casually. I had this dream and I went upstairs and she was in the kitchen and I looked around and we were in our house from the seventies and she says I've got a message for you Johnny, you know you're gonna get nut cancer. <laughs> so thanks ma. And so I woke up and I turned on the light. Whoa, wow, what a peculiar dream! And she's still in the room. And she looks over at him and says, oh, uh, one more thing. I, I forgot to tell you. Uh, can you tell George to check his rear passenger tire? He ran over a screw the other day. And he's like, oh, thanks, Ma. And then she's gone. And so he calls George up. Yeah, sorry to call you so early. Can you check your rear passenger tire? And six hours later, he gets a call. And George is like, how did you know that I had a screw in my tire? And John's like, oh, yeah, Mom came and she told me. And he's like, oh, OK, well, tell her thanks. <laughs> And they just go through this crap all the time. And I wouldn't believe that it happened. But then George will tell me the story. And he's like, yeah, so I went out and there are sure it was. I, how do you explain crap like that? I don't know. I, I talk about my uncle a lot because I lived with him for a long time. He was sort of my role model. He was the closest thing I had to a big brother. So I looked up to him and listened to the things that he had to say and just treated him as gospel. You know, he certainly doesn't think that ghosts are bad or malevolent or anything like that. And you mentioned the sixth sense a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the ghosts in the sixth sense were particularly evil. No. But they, they were scary as hell. They were <laughs> scary true. as a word far worse than hell. Scary as the Dickens. <laughs> Today's episode contains language that is unsuitable for children. Do we even need to talk about ghosts? Have, we, we talked recently in an episode. Have you ever seen a ghost? Yeah. I could not handle seeing a ghost. Yeah, the idea is a freaky thing. I think that's good, right? As far as ghosts go. Sure. So what else you got, Rish? You okay, got so, anything? So you already know you what my number actually one is. Scary. Hey, you agreed with me on cockroaches. Play the tape back, R.O.T. 
What's number one? You know what number one is. Guess. Old ladies. Number one, old women. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's a terror of old women. Have you seen the trailer for Legion? It's the newest pseudo-religious apocalyptic horror film okay. that, that's, that's coming out. It's probably out by the time this episode hits the air. But there's this old woman that comes into a diner and the waitress that serves her is pregnant. The old woman is like, oh, when are you due? And the woman says, and she's like, oh, your child is going to burn. And her face contorts and it becomes CG and her mouth opens farther than a woman's face could open. And she jumps onto the ceiling and spider walks across the ceiling. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? You just guaranteed that one rich Benjamin Outfield is not going to be watching <laughs> Legion. You know, real old people don't actually turn into spiders and walk on the ceiling. I beg to differ, sir, because in 1989, I... Okay, you may have a point there. But I think it goes hand in hand with the children thing. Old women are typically harmless. Right. They, they, they have a tendency to be gentle and weak and vulnerable. And, you know, it's always little old lady got mutilated late last night. Yeah. Stuff On like that. On the news, they're the ones that are the victims, not the perpetrators. I'm sorry, could you say that word in English? <laughs> no, it doesn't exist in English. Like you said, your children fear and your old ladies fear. It's not those things in themselves that you're afraid of. It's those things in the wrong place. It's, it's like back when we did the October Scary Story event story that Kevin Anderson did Halloween oh, in July. And there was these children ghosts and basically children themselves, they're not scary, but you put a child in the wrong place, take it out of its context and put it in some weird context out in the middle of the farmy expanse of nowhere. This child is knocking on the door trick or treating. There's something really freaky about that. Okay, so it's the context. Yeah. And Lon Chaney Sr. said something very famous that, that people still repeat to this day. And he said, everybody loves a clown. But nobody likes a clown at midnight. Clowns kind of scare me, to tell you the truth. I think our entire generation is afraid of clowns, probably because of things like It, the clown doll that terrorized the boy Robbie in, in Poltergeist. They're, they're, they're just something really freaky about them. I don't know if it's just the makeup that they have. Clowns are always old people, too. It's been a long time since it seems that clowns have been funny. No, and that's that's totally valid. And so the context of an old woman. Did, did you ever see Swordfish with Hugh Jackman? I was an extra on that. I only saw the part where Holly Berry shows us her boobs. Yeah, I wasn't actually in that scene. Oh, Darn it. I, I just I, fast forwarded to that and then I turned it off after that was done. I worked on a couple of – did you really? <laughs> you derailed my story. <laughs> there was a couple of nightclub scenes in that. And I was a, a club goer. Isn't that what they call him? Clubber? Clubber Lang. I pity the fool that gets in the ring with me. I want my boy. Sorry. And we spent a lot of time just hanging out. And I believe What Lies Beneath came out around that time. And I God, this is such a lame story. I know I've told you before. <laughs> I've told other people. And they've never reacted the way that those extras that were hanging out with me that night did. I saw What Lies Beneath... And then I was unable to go to sleep that night because every time I closed my eyes, I kept seeing an old woman on her hands and knees crawling across the floor of my room toward my bed. And I don't know where that image came from, but it freaked, sorry, language folks, the dickens out of me. So I was telling these guys this just to kill time where we have conversations. That's something that I sort of miss about the whole extra work is the tons of downtime that you had to read books and to write stories and to just get to know the other people that you're working with. And sure, some of them were shanks, but for the most part, you actually make friends and stuff. I, I miss that. And we were just killing time. And I told this story of the old woman crawling across the carpet. And one of the guys just freaked out. And he's like, dude, don't talk about that anymore. But I see it. And I was like, what? And he's like, I can see it in my mind. He's like, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. To be honest, it made me feel better <laughs> about my fear and about my storytelling ability that this guy was freaking out 
So, you know, I smile and I've told other people the story of the old woman and they're like, huh, okay, so was she naked? What was the deal? I'm like, no, no, she was in a nightgown. Anyhow, I am just so afraid. I imagine that all it would take is is somebody to get their aged aunt to crawl across my apartment floor one day and I would die of a heart attack. I don't know why they would want to do that. Just maybe because our lengthy episodes. I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> you, you could get me out of the way. You could yeah, bump me off. You know, she c- could even be a witness. She's like, oh, it was the darndest thing. He filled his pants and then he died. I was just crawling around. I was trying to find my earring. Oh, uh, yeah. Good. It's like, but ma- ma'am, you seem to be covered with blood. No, it's just corn syrup. Oh, it's okay. red. It's Here, like, but, taste it. But those creepy white contacts you've got on, ma'am? <laughs> I need them. The optometrist prescribed them. Oh, all right. I I, I noticed that you have black fingernails. <laughs> I'm goth. <laughs> all right. Well, I think you've answered all my questions. You, you're free to go, ma'am. <laughs> I don't know that any of my fears are especially irrational. But some of the things that I'm most afraid of, you know, I'm afraid of getting in a car accident. I, I think that's not totally irrational. I mean, well, I everybody... drive a lot. I have a long ways to go to get to work. So law of averages, sooner or later, it's coming. Everybody knows somebody who's been in a serious car yeah. accident or has died in a car accident. I mean, I, I certainly have. Wait, I, I haven't died. I, I, I know somebody. <laughs> that's one of the fears that I have. I am also deathly afraid of anything happening to my children or happening to my wife. Like becoming evil. evil. <laughs> that already happened years ago. <laughs> There's not like a little spider or something that will send me running. I am unfortunately the person that's always called to take care of them. You know, we talked about the difference between crickets and cockroaches. My kids are afraid of both. I go down there and take the shoe off of the foot that, you know, they were standing there next to the cricket with and smash the cricket because they're too afraid to just do it themselves. I suppose there's probably some irrational fears that I have. And if I really did some soul searching, I might come up with them. But I I did a crappy, lazy job and couldn't think of anything. No, you know what? We've been talking for a few minutes and I hope that this has been entertaining to people. I love talking about this stuff, especially (laughs) things that I'm passionate about. Uh And when else am I going to get a forum? I'm not working on Swordfish 2 or anything like that where I've got a captive audience. But listeners, if... You have a morbid obsession with something or some unnatural fear. Share it on the uh, blog page. Just put a comment on there. You know, if we get enough really interesting ones, maybe we'll do a follow-up and we'll, we'll address each one and talk about whether we are afraid of that or not. Yeah, that'd be fun. So, as you can tell by the changing of the leaves and the creepy music on the radio and the icy wind that blows late at night, unless you're in California or Florida... Where that doesn't apply. Texas or Arizona. October is finally upon us. Oh, yeah. That means that it's time for the October Scary Story event. That's right. The clock is ticking. You have one month to write your scary story. You have to have it done by the 31st at midnight. So get on it if you haven't already. And you know what? Really, it's more of an exercise. It's always been see if you can write a story within this 31-day period. You know, don't start it in September and then carry on the whole year and or whatever. Just you have a day to start and you have a day to stop and see if you can pull it off. You know, if you're out there and you've got a story you wrote in 1983, that doesn't help you. It's just you write the story in this month. It's a motivator to write. Yeah, that's really what it is. Uh, unfortunately for us, we're the type of people that need a bit of motivation to write. And a deadline. Yeah. I guess I did write that one story in Canada. But aside from that, the only stories I've written in the past year were last year's October Scary Story event and then the Broken Mirror Story event. So I really need somebody to... uh, That's still going? I think I'm going to have it forever. It amuses me. (laughs) Doesn't it amuse you too? On the contrary, my dear. Um... So, you know, cheating on the contest, not really going to help you out any. You can do it if you want, I guess. You'll probably be able to pull the wool over our eyes. We'll We're not, never know. Even though you're still using the word rad in your story as though it was in common usage I, by I, people I, other than Rish. Oh. You know, it's not going to help you as a writer. So please, put in the work. It'll make you better in the end. Yeah, I don't know if I talked last year about my story 
But it had been one that I had wanted to write for years, and I never had the motivation. I never had the impetus to write it down. So thanks to this contest or this event or this exercise, I wrote that story that wouldn't have been written otherwise. Wait, the story you wrote last year was one that you told me when we were like in college, right? Yeah, that was an old story. I did a new version, I guess you could say, because I think I wrote it once when I was in Cheetah! eighth grade or something like that. But uh, it was time to uh, give it a, an adult version. <laughs> oh, yes. Anyways. So if you've got a scary story that you haven't started yet, good. Start it. You have until the 31st. Send it in to submissions at doonsteef.com. Put O-S-S-E or October Scary Story Event or, I don't know, the F word in the subject line and send it to us. And uh, we'll, what will we do? We won't just reject your story. We'll reject you personally. That's what we're going to do. I think that's one of my biggest fears in life. <laughs> Actually, we need to do an episode where we talk about fears sometime. Yeah, we should. Send it on in and we'll uh, we'll remind you throughout this month. Yeah. Well, I, I, one last thing. If people want to help us with audio work or voices and stuff, I had problems with my microphone. The fan being on made some kind of static, and then just the speakers being on, there was some kind of interference, and that ruined the first read-through of the story. So if you folks are sending in things and they, you seem to have problems, try turning off the fan and the speakers. Just that may be what's going on. But what, what did you think of my reading, by the way? Uh, I thought it was good. Huh, okay. Yeah. On a scale of one to ten, at least got a four. Wow. Maybe even a three. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I guess that's our show. Huh? Um, I guess I'll send us out then. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, clearing the tears out of my voice. What has that got to do with anything? Uh, well, in the words of the really crappy Yoda puppet, everything. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Yeah, uh, we're done with the Muppet thing. Oh. Hey, R-O-E-D-O-T. R-O-E-D-O-T. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. And now it's time to beg for donations. We have to do it. Please press the button. Take two. He also gave me pro tip, pro tip, pro trip tiling. He also gave me pro tip to lean. He also gave me pro trip to lean, pro trip tiling. He also gave me pro trip to Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change the line to weed. He also gave me weed. Are you muppeting on purpose? Or is I'm not muppeting. I, I just sound like a muppet. It sounds a lot like a Jim Henson <laughs> creation, but not one of the really inspired ones that not remains. It's ones. one of from like 1972 that was gone by 75. It's like Scooter or somebody that nobody really cares about. Was he Scooter? I don't know.